welcome to our curated panel, our short oral presentations on trans health. So this presentation will be taking place um, mainly in English with most of the presentations happening in English. Um, and so, si vous êtes francophone et puis que vous souhaitez écouter la présentation en français, euh, on vous invite à vous joindre à la salle d'interprétation en direct euh, pour pouvoir suivre les pr présentations en français. So, um, I, I have, uh, my name is Francesco McAllister Caruso. I am the communications manager uh, at CBRC, and I had the pleasure of moderating today's panel on trans health. Um, so just before we get started, I wanted to uh, go over some housekeeping rules just to make sure that everyone's on the same page and that we're ready to uh, start these great conversations. So as a reminder of how the session is going to work out, we have uh, four great presentations lined up for you today uh, that have been pre-recorded and captioned uh, to make it as accessible as possible. And so I will be introducing uh, the speakers right before um, their presentation is played. So you'll be able to hear a little about them uh, in their bio. Just as a reminder for everyone tuning in today um, that we do have a set of community guidelines for everyone participating in Summit 2020. And so if you are not aware of those yet, we encourage you to uh, go check those out. They are available on the uh, Summit 2020 webpage by going to www.cbrc.net forward slash summit underscore 2020. And so generally uh, the rules uh, are pretty straightforward. Um, just be respect respectful of everyone's experiences and uh, ask questions from a place of learning we encourage you to ask questions all throughout uh, the presentation. Just drop them in the chat and we will be answering them at the very end of the presentation once all the pre-recordings are done. And so uh, another quick reminder that uh, some conversations that may happen today in this panel or in other panels throughout Summit may be difficult to hear. Uh, they may make uh, you feel triggered, or anxious or distressed. Um, if that's the case and you want to talk to someone, we have to talk to someone, we have a team of counselors and mental health uh, support workers available through the participant directory chat um, that you can reach out to uh, if ever you feel anxious or overwhelmed. You can identify those uh, counselors with the letter C in their profile picture in the directory, and then you can uh, chat with them in a timely manner um, after sending them a message. And so just a uh, last heads up, uh, like I mentioned, most of the presentations today will be happening in English. We will have one presentation in French um, from Etienne Chamberlain uh, that will be happening third. And so if ever you can't speak French, we encourage you to join the live interpretation room um, at that time. I'll also give a, a heads up before Etienne's presentation. So you have the time to switch into that room if you need captioning or if you need interpretation, sorry. Um, and you can uh, access those rooms under the Summit 2020 Rooms section of the main page of the platform. So uh, without further ado, I uh, have the pleasure to kick off this presentation with uh, Robbie Ahmed's uh, presentation. I'm going to introduce Robbie first and then we will uh, play their presentation uh, that they've pre-recorded for us. So Robbie is a trans artist, activist, and a professional speaker. He's currently the project manager for the update of Prime, a sexual health resource for trans masculine, trans men, and non-binary individuals who are into men at the Gay Men's Sexual Health Alliance. His previous community work includes running support programs and campaigns for racialized youth at the Alliance for South Asian AIDS Prevention, ASAP, and sitting on the board of directors for an ethnocultural mental health organization in Toronto, advocating for culturally appropriate LGBTQ mental health services. He's the spokesperson for the Toronto for All campaign for racialized trans youth and a writer at Nuance, a sexual health publication for first and second gen immigrant youth. He's also a co-organizer with the WAYF, Where Are You From Collective, an arts activism project for Pan-Asian youth, which is now running the Decolonizing Gender Project. So without further ado, I will invite um, Robbie's pre-recorded presentation to be played. Hello, my name is Robbie Ahmed, and I'm a project manager for Primed, a sexual health guide for trans men, trans masculine, and non-binary people with the Gay Men's Sexual Health Alliance. Today, I'll be presenting on creating trans inclusive sexual health resources. So Primed is a third update of a guide that was developed in 2007 by gay, bi, queer, trans men's working group. 
So now in 2020, it was updated with 11 advisory members and from over 100 voices from across Ontario. It's a 68 page guide covering topics such as sexual health, PrEP and PEP, vaccines, and other topics in both English and French. So it's launching at end of November. So I would say keep a lookout for our launch on the GMSHS page. So, so why do we need more trans inclusive gen tra general sexual health resources? So from the research uh, called Getting Primed, Informing HIV Prevention with Gay, Bi, Queer, Trans Men in Ontario, uh, it was found that due to the lack of inclusive language and representation, trans people felt that general sexual health information, such as around condom usage and other sexual health prevention strategies and messages did not pertain to them, and hence Primed was created. So now we know that sexual health information is keeping involved, is evolving every single time and we want to ensure that when we creating our own resources and websites that they are trans inclusive. So I wanted to share with you some of the tools we as a Prime team have used to develop Prime so that you can use also in your own in your own research uh, websites and other resources. So the first tool is around language. So trans inclusive language matters. We can make assumptions about people's bodies and a lot of times our language around bodies is very gendered. For example, we say penis in a vagina when we could be using more neutral terms such as external internal genitalia. So this table comes from Planned Parenthood's guidelines for sexual health service providers and educators. It is a free PDF that's available online and I highly recommend that you check it out. So, um, but aside from language, there's also some biological realities for trans people. For example, we know that PrEP takes longer for frontal holes or vaginal, hole, vaginal holes than it does for anal sex. And it is recommended that people who have frontal holes take rec are recommended to be taking daily prep. There's also reproductive health realities such as can I be in testosterone and birth control at the same time. So to learn more about these, uh, we would want you to check out Primed or also Rainbow Health Ontario. Now, lastly, we want to talk about representation. Although we are having a lot more sexual health information now that's creating focus groups and engaging trans people. However, sometimes there is lack of imagery that is trans related. So that makes trans people feel that maybe this information does not speak or have consulted them. So one way is to run around that in case you don't have funding to take photos of trans people, where you could be including trans flags and symbols that are sometimes free stock photos. There's also a guide by Broadly called free gender inclusive stock photos that are created. And one thing to keep in mind around stock, around representation of trans folks is that we wanna be including people of different body types. We wanna be including people regardless of surgery or whether they have access to hormones and at different stages of their transition. So to end it with it, I wanted to list some of the resources. One of them is the Planned Parenthood guide that I've mentioned before. There's also Rainbow Health Ontario's online LGBTQ Health Connect, which connects service providers to trans-related or queer-related health. There's also one of my favorite guides is the Designing Trans-Inclusive Forms and Surveys, and it was very useful in terms of trans research and creating survey monkeys that was able to ask people in a more questions related to their bodies and their gender identities. There's also the Brazen Guide for Sexual, uh, Sexual Health Guide for Trans Women and Trans Feminine People. Now, I know there's a lot to cover, and of course, this is only the tip of an iceberg when it comes to Prime, but one thing we wanted to give participants uh, is a free link to the PDF of Prime to learn a lot more about it. And like I said, the Prime is launching in November, so please stay tuned. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Robbie, for sending that video in. Um, I think that you touched on so many great points, uh, and especially especially around the language that we, we use. Um, I myself, I mean, being in a communications uh, role, uh, I think that that's something that uh, we're starting to pay a lot more attention to. Um, 
uh, with do note with uh, which is very very important. Um, I also want to give folks a heads up before we move into the second presentation. I just sent it in the chat. Um, we will actually be having Etienne's presentation second, not third. And so uh, now is a good time. If ever you don't uh, speak French and you would like to follow along with Etienne's presentation, you can switch into the live interpretation room uh, now. And so without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce Etienne. And so Etienne Chamberlain uh, has several skills in terms of socio-professional involvement and experiential knowledge. Indeed, he's a speaker, trainer, and a facilitator. He has nearly 10 years of experience in social integration through art, as well as a dedicated involvement with ADIC, the Association for uh, the Defense of the Rights and Inclusion of People Who Use Drugs in Quebec. Following his transition in 2014, he became involved with the trans community in order to improve access to injection and prevention equipment, as well as to facilitate access to naloxone by organizing, among other things, training for the trans community. He has also contributed to denouncing the lack of emergency housing for trans people, particularly the situation for trans men who do not have access to men's shelters. He's now pursuing his mission with Rizzo in Montreal, where he holds a position as an outreach worker. And so, once again, folks, good time to switch into the live interpretation room if needed. And I will uh, let uh, Etienne take it away with his pre recorded presentation. Voici uh, ma présentation Le guide hot et les activités qui en découlent. Uh, Je vais être accompagnée pour cette présentation de Shinri Deschamps et Julien Leroux Pichartun qui vont nous parler euh, de leur expérience. Donc, euh, dans cette présentation, euh, nous allons parler des personnes cis pour parler des personnes cisgenres, euh, donc l'identité de genre égale le genre assigné à la naissance, et des personnes trans pour parler des personnes euh, et trans pour parler des personnes trans dont l'identité de genre n'égale pas celui assigné à la naissance. Euh, petite histoire de Réseau. Ben, Réseau, c'est un organisme communautaire sans but lucratif montréalais actif depuis 1991 auprès des hommes gays ou bisexuels, cis ou trans, et les hommes ayant des relations sexuelles avec d'autres hommes. Donc, la petite histoire de Réseau dans la grande histoire de l'inclusion des gars trans. En 2010, l'organisme, en réponse aux besoins exprimés, a changé de nom pour devenir Réseau et a élargi également son mandat euh, désormais, euh, pour désormais aborder différentes dimensions de la santé physique, affective, mentale et, sexu euh, et sociale. En 2015, euh, Réseau a ajouté le terme « cis et trans » au mandat de l'organisme. Euh, bien que les services étaient déjà offerts, l'idée euh, c'était de, de visibiliser plus clairement cette partie de l'offre de service de l'organisme et en 2018, le projet Homme Trans Hot est mis en place. Euh, la création du guide Hot, euh, pour créer un guide qui répond aux besoins des hommes trans, nous avons fait des rencontres individuelles, un groupe de discussion ainsi qu'une enquête en ligne. Je vous invite à aller voir l'affiche pour avoir un aperçu des résultats. Nous avons aussi questionné des hommes cis pour connaître leurs besoins en matière de relations avec les hommes trans, étant donné qu'une partie du guide leur était destinée. Peu de guides existent sur le sujet. Il y en a un en Ontario, euh, mis à jour en 2015, et les informations sur le VIH ne sont plus à jour, notamment sur la PrEP et sur le I égale I, euh, indétectable égale intransmissible. Lors de la réaction du De la rédaction du guide HOT, nous voulions tenir compte des besoins de chacun, autant cis que trans. Pour les photos, ben, nous avons choisi d'y aller dans la sensualité, comme suggéré par des participants du groupe de discussion. Avec, le, avec ce guide, organisé en deux parties complémentaires, cis et trans, nous proposons un contenu adapté au vécu de chacun, afin de réduire la distance et les préjugés qui peuvent encore exister entre les gars cis et trans. Bien que le sommaire soit le même, les sujets sont expliqués de manière différente. Par exemple, dans la section hormones du côté cis, on explique plus les effets des hormones sur le corps, alors que dans le côté trans, ben, on va aborder plus les techniques d'injection et les effets secondaires. Pour le choix des photos, on a invité euh, plusieurs personnes différentes pour avoir le plus de diversité possible, afin que le plus grand nombre puisse se reconnaître. 
Alors, Julien euh, va nous partager euh, son expérience lors des rencontres individuelles pour la création euh, du guide. Euh, donc, euh, bonjour tout le monde. Moi, c'est Julien. J'ai 34 ans. Je suis un homme trans. Euh, ça fait déjà une dizaine d'années que j'ai entamé ma transition et euh, j'ai une phalloplastie. Euh, donc, euh, ça a été super important pour moi quand Étienne m'a parlé du projet HUT. Euh, parce que c'est un besoin qui est dans la communauté. Euh, en tant qu'homme euh, trans qui a des relations avec d'autres hommes cis, euh, des fois, c'est très difficile d'avoir des relations euh, sexuelles qui sont saines et euh, ainsi euh, une bonne compréhension. Donc, euh, les, les rencontres individuelles avec Étienne, ça m'a permis de ventiler, d'avoir des conseils, des ressources. Euh, et puis, le guide euh, est vraiment un très bel outil pour euh, autant informer les hommes cis qui sont gays, qui ont des relations sexuelles avec d'autres hommes trans et transmasculins. Euh, parce que souvent, justement, avec l'hormonothérapie, avec les chirurgies, nos corps sont différents, réagissent différemment et on peut avoir des besoins qui sont soit semblables ou différents qu'un homme cis ou gay. Un homme cis et gay. Euh, donc... Euh, des fois, ça, ça peut mener à des, des quiproquos dans les relations, des, de l'incompréhension. Et surtout dans les milieux gays, souvent les hommes trans, on ne sait pas trop comment se comporter, comment réagir et, euh, et, et comment bien entretenir et interagir avec les, les hommes gays de, du milieu. On va passer maintenant euh, aux activités qui découlent du projet HUT. Une clinique spécifique euh, est offerte trois fois par année. Euh, cette clinique, ben, ça offre la possibilité d'avoir un service respectueux et sécuritaire tout en offrant une réponse aux besoins et enjeux spécifiques aux hommes trans et personnes transmasculines. En effet, lors de cette clinique, en plus des dépistages réguliers, est offert la possibilité d'avoir accès à un pap test. Euh, un intervenant est présent sur place afin de répondre aux besoins et questions des personnes qui viennent à la clinique. On a aussi plusieurs euh, matériels de prévention, dont euh, du matériel un peu plus adapté, qui est offert gratuitement aux hommes trans et aux personnes transmasculines. Euh, ainsi sont disponibles des seringues et des aiguilles pour l'injection d'hormones, du matériel adapté euh, aux divers corps des hommes trans et personnes transmasculines, comme des digues dentaires, des doigtiers, des condons internes, ainsi que des gants. On a aussi créé un groupe d'entraide. Euh, C'est un groupe d'entraide et de discussion par et pour les hommes trans et personnes transmasculines. Ce projet comporte 10 rencontres à raison d'une rencontre par semaine où plusieurs sujets sont abordés et où les participants sont invités à partager leur information et leur expérience en lien avec le sujet de la rencontre. Le sujet propos, les sujets proposés sont variés et au choix des participants. La santé sexuelle, les relations affectives, les prothèses et les chirurgies d'affirmation du genre, la navigation du milieu gay comme les saunas et les applications de rencontres, etc. Maintenant, je vais laisser la parole à Chénerie. Donc, euh, moi, c'est Chénerie, j'ai 34 ans, je suis un homme trans. Euh, mon parcours a commencé en 2004. Et euh, avec ma dernière intervention, qui était la phalloplastie en 2014, euh, au début de ma transition, j'ai créé le forum d'un autre genre euh, pour les personnes trans francophones du Québec pour essayer de tenter de rejoindre la communauté et de créer une, un réseau d'entraide dans un moment où il n'y avait pas d'informations ou presque. Euh, Aujourd'hui, ça m'a amené à faire un retour aux études en sexologie, où est-ce que j'espère je, pouvoir continuer à aider la communauté. Puis au travers de tout ça, j'ai pu participer au groupe de soutien de réseau, euh, ce qui m'a permis de pouvoir partager toutes les connaissances que j'ai acquis avec les autres personnes hommes trans et transmasculines, euh, ce que je trouve qui est toujours vraiment important de pouvoir partager. Et euh, donc, on a pu parler de chirurgie d'hormones, mais aussi, aussi de parler comment naviguer le, le milieu gay, parce que ça peut être vraiment intimidant. Comment, comment naviguer et comment vivre nos relations. Donc, tout ça, ben, ça me fait vraiment du bien de pouvoir me retrouver avec d'autres comme moi qui vivent la même chose, peu importe à quel niveau qu'on est rendu dans notre transition. Euh, dans la prochaine édition du guide, le guide sera aussi offert en anglais et en espagnol. Euh, le guide est aussi disponible 
en format papier et format numérique. Le format numérique, vous allez le retrouver euh, sur notre site Internet à l'adresse suivante. Alors, merci. All right. Merci beaucoup, Étienne, pour ta présentation préenregistrée. Euh, je pense vraiment que ben, on va avoir une période de questions à la fin pour pouvoir euh, te poser plus et en savoir plus. Mais je pense vraiment que tu as tué un point qui est super important, euh, que, que le fait d'adresser le même problème, mais spécifiquement puis de différentes façons pour différentes démographiques, euh, je pense que ça a vraiment un impact positif sur la façon que les gens vont recevoir euh, le message. Fait que merci pour ça. Um, so a heads up to folks, if you're listening uh, and you try to join the live interpretation room, you may have noticed that it is not uh, currently being offered for the session. We apologize. There was a uh, technical uh, issue with that. So currently the interpretation is being offered for uh, A1, the COVID uh, panel. It was supposed to be for trans, but uh, the trans health panel, but we will um, fix that for the future sessions going forward. But um, please feel free to ask your questions uh, in the chat. And specifically, if you have questions for Etienne around the uh, hot project, um, then I will be able to ask those to him in French. And then I can uh, quickly translate uh, the answers in English. And so we will uh, now be moving forward to our third presentation, uh, this time from Mike Smith and Andy Lassoff from ACT. And so I will introduce them briefly and then we will uh, head into their pre-recorded presentation. So Mike Smith, uh, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, here with us today live, but who is in the uh, presentation. Uh, so Mike Smith, they, them, theirs, is a queer, non-binary, white settler and acts gay men's health systems coordinator. As a side hustle, Mike recently established a human resources and LGBTQ inclusion consulting business. Mike's approach to coping with COVID includes a fine balance of classical music, physical activity, and most importantly, Ativan for those pesky panic attacks. Andy Lassard is a white settler, queer trans man based in Toronto. He has a background in harm reduction, peer support, and community reach, or community outreach, pardon. Andy has lived experience uh, navigating mental health and addiction system and is passionate about supporting people to have access to access supports and resources that work for them. So without further ado, I will now uh, pass it on to both of them for their pre-recorded presentation. Hi folks. Our presentation today will describe some of our ideas on how to increase the access and uptake of HIV testing services for trans men and trans masculine folks in Toronto. We are drawing our information from a, a community consultation we conducted in June, 2020. We interviewed six trans men and trans masculine folks living in Toronto in hopes to better understand the unique healthcare access needs of this population and to develop a new engagement strategy. We also draw upon the findings from TransPulse and SexNow studies. As part of our literature review, we were hoping to find some information regarding HIV prevalence among trans men in Canada, but unfortunately, it appears as if this information does not exist. In 2010, the Ontario HIV Treatment Network reviewed the literature dated from 2004 to 2010 and reported that there is no substantial evidence of HIV prevalence um, among Canadian trans men. Though findings of the SexNow 2018 and 2019 studies do not provide information on prevalence, uh, we do have a better idea of what is going on within this population. Uh, among the respondents living in Ontario who identified as trans male, 9% self-reported living with HIV. So it seems like trans men who have sex with men are definitely at risk for HIV, but what do we know about their risk? Again, from the SexNow study, 30% of trans male respondents in Toronto report, reported a HERI MSM score of 10 or more. This means that nearly a third of respondents have a high enough risk of HIV that they should consider taking PrEP. However, the HERI MSM has not been verified with trans men or AFAB non-binary folks. So it is uncertain whether this is a valid measurement for trans folks. We should also be considering other biomedical, psychosocial, and economic factors that may impact risk. So we are faced with some significant knowledge gaps. Uh, and until we have this evidence, our efforts to plan and strengthen healthcare systems will not receive the funding and attention required to really improve access and uptake. I would like to turn the time now to Andy to uh, describe some of the experiences from our respondents. 
Our interviews with informants suggest that most of Toronto's sexual health services do not meet the healthcare needs of trans men, trans masculine, or assigned female at birth folks. Informants identified a number of barriers that have negatively impacted their experiences in accessing sexual health care and generally characterize their experiences in access, accessing health care as poor. As one informant put it, I wish these weren't my experiences. These negative experiences have become the norm. I tend to have massive rants after doctor's appointments. Even the good places are not great. I have to prep myself for these things. It's way too frequent of a conversation. I need chain mail to engage with medical systems these days. So what went wrong? In reviewing transcripts, a few themes emerged where we can make improvements to make our spaces easier to access and better able to serve trans men and AFAB folks. Speaking to low levels of cultural competency, one of our informants stated, yes, they went to medical school. They did their training. They clearly have enough medical experience, but when it comes to actual sensitivity or understanding and comprehension of anyone who is not cis, it's pretty low. Some of the specific issues that came up around cultural competency were misgendering or referring to people in ways that do not align with their gender identity. This can look like using the wrong pronouns. It can also look like actively directing people away from services because assumptions are being made about people's gender and whether or not they quote unquote belong in certain spaces. I'll talk more about this in a minute. Another issue that came up was dead naming or referring to someone by the name they received at birth or a name they used to go by that no longer aligns with their gender identity or sense of self. This is a big issue to consider if you're working reception or if you're gonna call upon someone in a waiting room. The legal name on someone's health card might be entirely different than what they go by now. It might be gendered in a way that makes them very uncomfortable. We can be better about understanding that changing one's legal name can be a long and costly experience for folks and make more of an effort to pay attention to preferred names. One informant suggested calling on people by last name in waiting room settings. That works too. Another issue that came up was around accessing gendered clinical spaces or spaces that promote themselves as being for men or male identified people and spaces that promote themselves as being for women or female identified people. As one informant put it, I have difficulty accessing healthcare when these spaces are gendered. I have been to these spaces where they say it is for men identified, but this doesn't help. It feels like the intent is to include more binary trans folks, but if you don't pass or identify one way or another, or if you're looking for sexual health specific things, it just becomes confusing. This ties into the issue of misgendering. One informant recounted a time when they went to a sexual health clinic that had gender segregated services, and they were told they should consider coming in at a different time because of how this service provider perceived the informant's gender presentation to be. This is a form of gatekeeping at our clinic doors that needs to be dismantled if we want to appropriately serve trans clients. Gendered clinical spaces can also, as our informant pointed out, have the effect of creating a barrier to sexual health care for non-binary folks who likely aren't going to be drawn to services that appeal to male identified or female identified people. There were also questions that came up about exactly what services can be provided in men's spaces for people who are assigned female at birth. If an AFAB person is symptomatic for, let's say, an internal infection, is a men's space going to be set up to do an internal exam? Different trans folks have different needs and we need to be explicit about who we serve and what services we can provide. Because of these complicated histories with healthcare systems, trans folks often refer and make recommendations amongst themselves when it comes to finding culturally competent healthcare. And because that cultural competency is so widely lacking, the wait times to see people who do have a solid reputation within the community are long. The implication of waiting for competent care is that trans folks live with unmet healthcare needs. In fact, according to a study by TransPulse in 2019, 42% of respondents reported un unmet healthcare needs in the past year. Other concerns that came up during consultations were around privacy, as demonstrated by this statement. When we consider the physical setup of these spaces, many of which have open concept waiting rooms, there is certainly the potential for outing folks who are trans. And it isn't just straight cis people who sometimes react poorly and inappropriately to the presence of a trans person, it comes from within gay and queer spaces as well. 
Our consultation informants described three main strategies to increase access and uptake within our organizations. First, I encourage all service providers to assess their level of transcultural competency, including topics such as gender diverse bodies and identities, affirming and inclusive communication strategies, the basics of hormone replacement therapy and transition related sur uh, surgeries, as well as mental health and sexual health care needs. There are institutions such as Rainbow Health Ontario with high quality and effective learning programs for all stakeholders involved in trans health. Based on your learning needs, invest in this professional development for you and your team. Second, we believe that self-testing will be an effective strategy to address the access barriers associated with low cultural competency, limited available services, and gendered spaces. Taking the HIV test out of the clinic or cis-centric spaces makes the, test, uh, the testing experience much safer, feasible, and more comfortable. And consequently, we expect and increase access and uptake to these services. And lastly, consultation informants this, uh, describes a need for trans-specific content, campaigns, and programs. Informants reported a disconnect with gay men's health content. Uh, experience taught them that when a service is not trans-specific, there is a greater risk for experiencing transphobia, exclusion, and gender-based violence. If you intend to include trans men, be specific and direct. Include this on your posters, your website, and your social media. Better yet, include visual cues of inclusion and belonging, such as trans models or the trans flag. Thank you for your attention today, and thank you to the CBRC. All right. Uh, thank you both, uh, Andy and Mike. Mike, who is unfortunately not able to, to be with us today. Um, but thank you both for that presentation. I feel like you touched on so many important points, especially around uh, cultural competency. Um, so like for, for trans and non-binary folks as well, but also in terms of ethnicity, there's just this, you know, tendency to create a, uh, a, a way of doing things um, with people who are privileged and then just trying to copy paste that, um, that, that methodology or that way of doing things uh, to other identities, which is you know, not at all conducive to, to good results. And it also puts a lot of stress on folks uh, to have to bear that burden of explaining um, and of doing the work while getting care. Uh, so I think there's gonna be a lot to touch on as well uh, during, those, uh, during the question period that we have. Um, but right before we head into question period, we have another uh, last presentation for you folks. Um, so this time it will be from Evan Westfall and Alexandra Marshall, both from the Institute uh, for Sexual Minority Studies and Services. So Evan Westfall, he, him, and Alexandra Marshall, she, her, are education coordinators at the Institute for Sexual Minority Studies and Services, uh, housed in the University of Alberta Faculty of Educational Psychology. As educators, they offer guest lectures and workshops on a series of topics relating to sexual health and gender diversity. Marshall runs Finns Rural, a program that educates rural Albertan students on 2SLGBTQ issues, promoting allyship. And Westfall is the lead organizer of the 2020 Alberta GSA Conference, a conference that builds support and capacity among Alberta GSA students and teachers. So take it away, both of you. Hello, today we're going to be speaking about trans athletics and inclusion. My name is Alex Marshall. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the education coordinator out of ISMIS. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Evan Westfall, who's the education coordinator at ISMIS as well. His pronouns are he, him. Great. And we're going to talk about trans athletics and inclusion. Um, we're going to debunk some myths for you today. Let's start by looking at the Songson HGH study, which spoke specifically to testosterone, endogenous testosterone to be even more specific, uh, and any correlation that may or may not exist between that and athletic performance. Uh, when I say endogenous testosterone, I mean testosterone your body naturally produces on its own. Sometimes people might assert that they think trans women have a competitive advantage because of testosterone, and this research will help us understand if that claim is true or not. So just looking at the graph, a little bit of basic information, the top box here measures people it, comp who competed in the men's category in the Olympics, and the bottom graph here represents people who competed in the women's category. These little blue dots 
represent levels of testosterone of individual athletes as measured in nanomoles per liter. So um, just to have a fun little guessing game, I want you to guess which number in the men's category between one and 15, would you think would represent powerlifting? And Songson's research shows that that is number one. So if you look here, uh, powerlifting is a sport that seems to select for really low levels of testosterone. And in fact, here, there's a correlation between having low levels of testosterone and your success within the Olympics or your ability to reach the Olympics and compete. Um, so if anyone tried to assert that a trans woman would have an advantage in powerlifting, that would be patently false if they were basing their argument based on testosterone. Let's look at another sport. How about ice hockey? Which number between 1 and 15 do you think would represent ice hockey? And we can see that as number 13. So if, if you look at ice hockey, particularly in the men's category, we see a huge spread, massive disparity within levels of endogenous testosterone. So that shows us that in the men's category, for ice hockey specifically, there's no correlation between levels of endogenous testosterone and competitive advantage in sport. If you're interested, you can see all of the different uh, sports here as per listed. Now, Alex and I are going to clip along at a very fast pace. Normally, our presentation is about two hours long. We're cutting everything down to eight minutes for you today. So if you want more information, you can book us for a lecture afterwards. In the meantime, I highly recommend reading into the research study on the team. It'll help you learn a little bit more about this information and some nuance. But let's move right along to look at some common arguments against the inclusion of trans individuals in, some, in sports and some practical rebuttals that you can use. First, let's look at the myth of competitive advantage. So um, a great way to address the myth of competitive advantage is by using age-graded scores. If you've never heard of an age-graded score before, um, it's a way of determining what percentile an athlete will be based on their age when compared by their peers. So um, hypothetically, if you had a man that was in the top 30% uh, of, of Olympians at the age 20, when compared to other Olympians at age 50, once he reaches the age 50, he would typically score within that same percentile at the age of 50. So it would stay the same when you're comparing him with his peers. Now, we've looked into research that looked at trans women before, during, and after their transition and it found the research found that if a trans woman was in the bottom 20th percentile before she transitioned when she was competing in the men's category then after she transitions she would still be in the bottom 20th percentile but now just of the of the women's category so trans women going through a gender transition actually doesn't boost their competitive performance in sports according to the research that we have looked into and that we will cite in our bibliography as we saw in the Songson study, endogenous testosterone, so that is testosterone naturally produced by the body, doesn't necessarily correlate with the competitive advantage. There's a number of different traits which are much more important when it comes to specific sports. So for example, height is much more uh, um, correlated to success in basketball than endogenous testosterone. So just looking at that one piece doesn't give us enough information to tell us if somebody's gonna be successful or not. And unfortunately, a lot of these issues are brought to the court of arbitration in sport. And in a legal sense, there's not a lot of scientific nuance that's understood. And they might just look at the levels of testosterone as measured in animals per liter, but they won't look at other complexities such as hormonal sensitivity of the individual, the number of receptors the individual has, or hormonal inactivation or catabolism. We're also going to speak to the myth of athletic fraud. So one thing, another argument that's often put forward is that allowing trans women to um, access women's sports uh, would lead to uh, a flood of men, cisgender men, uh, trying to achieve great success. To date, there hasn't really been any documentation of a number of cisgender men undergoing the whole process of transition just to gain an advantage in sports. And ultimately, it's something of a log logical fallacy that uh, this would happen and it victim blames trans women for the actions of cisgender men. So this is really echoed by if you look at the bathroom bills and kind of the idea of giving trans women access to women's spaces, for example, in bathrooms. 
one argument that was often made was that suddenly cisgender men would be entering those spaces and committing assaults, which we just haven't really seen. And in the end, it isn't really fair to say to trans women, we're not going to give you the right of access to sport because we're worried that another group might abuse that right. It doesn't really leave uh, trans women the rights that they should have. Yeah. And my favorite myth is the myth that this is a valid issue, that we should even be wasting our time debating this, uh, because trans women have been competing in sports for a long time. We could cite Renee Richards specifically, a trailblazer who is a trans woman who competed in the 1976 US Open. Um, so we have like more than 40 years of data, close to 50 years of data. And at that time, and that whole history of trans women competing in sports, we've never seen trans women massively sweep through the Olympics with success or re achieve massive accolades. The IOC has allowed trans women to compete openly since 2004. There hasn't even been a trans woman who's qualified in that entire amount of time. So again, that idea that suddenly there will no longer be cisgender women competing and winning in uh, women's categories just hasn't held up and we haven't seen any evidence of that in the past 16 years that it's been allowed in the IOC, let alone in other sporting groups and categories. Also, these kind of uh, regulations and restrictions are particularly discriminatory towards people who are intersex. Ultimately, humans aren't uh, sexually dimorphic, meaning that they aren't a species that has a huge difference between male and female. Any single trait that you can think of that is sex related, there's a, a total overlap. So for example, height, even though men may be taller than women, there are women who are taller than men and there are men who are shorter than women, despite that average. Things like bone density, muscle density, hormone levels, hormone sensitivity, any single one of those traits have a, a complete overlap between the two. So trying to imagine that there's this category that is perfect and there's no way to, there's, it's perfectly able to separate people into, just doesn't really reflect the reality. And here we have a bibliography of all of our sources. If you want to learn more, if you want a deeper dive into this information and you'd like to book a full lecture, reach us at eWestfall at ualberta.ca for me or jam20 at ualberta.ca for Alex. Take care and have a wonderful day. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Evan and Alex. Uh, that was amazing. Such an insightful presentation. And also kudos to all of you presenters who have somehow managed to condense your presentations into eight minutes. I know that we put that, re that uh, requirement on you, uh, but it's still a feat uh, that is definitely applauded and appreciated uh, for being able to condense all that information so nicely. Um, I think that especially what you said around uh, the issues of trans folk, intersex folk, um, but it also, it, it also touches on uh, issues of cis folks um, who have some degree uh, of intersexness or not. Um, I think, I'm thinking, you know, there's a lot of examples, but most recently, uh, Castor Semenya, um, you know, being so, and which also intersects uh, with kind of the application of whiteness and the, the expectations that athletes conform to the white standards of testosterone levels or uh, of, other, uh, of other measures like you mentioned. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for, for bringing those insights. Um, so like I mentioned in the chat, we're now going to move to the Q&A portion of this uh, panel. So if ever you have any questions for folks, please just uh, put them in the chat and I will make sure to ask them uh, to either all of our panelists or a specific panelist if you have a specific question. Um, just to get started, I think I can ask a question to Robbie. Um, specifically about, uh, so you mentioned Primed, you're working on Primed. How would participants get a copy of Primed? Uh, so our launch is at the end of November. So I'm going to give my email. So if participants can email me, I will keep the, email them the copies as they are out slash the website. And that's how, and you would also hopefully be in our mailing list for any of the extra transsexual health resources that are coming out slash trainings. Awesome. Thank you. And so Robbie just put his uh, email in the chat. So just note that down if ever uh, you want to get a copy. Um, so thank you, Robbie. Uh, I'll maybe move into a uh, question for Etienne. Uh, donc Etienne, je te pose la question. And I'll also for folks, because uh, I know we're having issues with the interpretation. So I'll, I'll quickly uh, sum up Etienne's answer uh, after he gives it to us. Um, fait quel genre euh, de défi ou quel genre de succès est-ce que votre équipe euh, a fait face euh, en créant le, le guide en deux parties? 
Ah, oh, mais je pense que tu es euh, en sourdine en ce moment. Oui, j'avais oublié. Euh, en fait, on a eu, euh, on ne s'attendait pas à avoir autant de répondants. On s'attendait, euh, en tout, on en a eu 50, pour, euh, 60, c'est-à-dire pour euh, l'enquête en ligne. Euh, ça, ça a été euh, une belle surprise. Et euh, aussi, dans, on a réalisé en, pose, euh, en, ana, en analysant euh, la recherche que euh, beaucoup de personnes s'identifiaient comme non-binaires. Donc, on a adapté euh, par la suite, euh, on était déjà avancé dans le guide, mais on a quand même adapté euh, le guide et les activités qui viennent après pour, pour répondre aux besoins. Merci, Étienne. Um, so, just a quick recap. So, Étienne's project, um, if you missed it earlier, came out with a report, two, two different reports, though uh, substantially uh, on the same topic, but for different audiences. So, one for uh, trans guys and one for cis guys to better understand the issues. And so um, there was, there seems to be a lot of uh, respondents more than uh, their team was expecting, um, which is a good sign for just the engagement of, of trans folks uh, who are, you know, helping to develop those, uh, those resources. Um, so I think we have a question in the chat. Uh, so for folks generally on the panel, feel free to just interject. Um, with a continuous barrage of transphobic misinformation around uh, trans folks in sports specifically, how can we encourage more trans folks to get physically active and to get involved in sports? So maybe uh, Evan and Alex, if you wanted to kick off on that. Absolutely. Yeah. Alex, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so yeah, this is, it's such a hard topic of like, how do you encourage people to go into a space where there is a lot of discrimination, where there's a lot of like made assumptions, there's a lot of difficulties in access. Um, and I think encouraging people to get involved in physical activity in any situation is going to be difficult. You know, some people just aren't necessarily <laughs> um, into physical activity. I would say looking at our spaces and making sure that they're inclusive. Um, and that can be done by anybody when you go into a space. Is there a spot for folks who are non-binary? Is there space created for that? Is there messaging that in, that like indicates inclusion. Um, a lot of sports places that I go to, um, if they, you know, had some sort of messaging like a, a pride flag or a trans flag or something like that, just indicating that. Um, parts of we often talk about um, when you post your expectations for a space, when you post like this space is inclusive of this or we don't allow this. Uh, you know, um, racist language, Islamophobic language, transphobic language, homophobic language. When that's posted prominently and allows people to see that coming in, that doesn't only set the expectation for the folks who, um, you know may themselves not be affected by that language and by that behavior, but also to folks who would be affected by it, they can say like, oh, I know if something happens, this place has my back. Like this place has posted as their expectations. This is what should be in there. So I think, um, you know, there's talking the talk, which is important. And then also just making sure that those spaces have the adequate training, have, um, you know, discussions about their group to make sure that when somebody comes in, hey, somebody in the washroom, like made me feel really uncomfortable by doing this, or somebody told me I wasn't allowed in this space, um, that, you know, they, they know they can go to the front desk, and somebody they'll be like, oh, that's totally inappropriate. That's not allowed. They can't do that. Because <laughs> it's part of their listed, you know, what's their thing. Yeah, and I would say um, for our approach, when you when we talk about the misinformation affecting trans individuals, creating a lack of access for trans folks, uh, I think one of the best ways to combat that is through education. And our approach is top down and bottom up. So Alex and I will lecture for um, for professors at universities, for postdoctorates, people doing their masters, university students, um, teachers that teach primary and secondary education, pre-service teachers, um, but then we also just teach students like as young as kindergarten, as old as grade 12. So I think it's about um, that top down so you can get the highest level of authority within uh, an educational institution informed on the subject, as well as people at the lowest level entry points. And I think that's one of the best ways to enact change there. Another huge piece I think is editing policy. A lot of policy is directly transphobic. And I think we see that particularly within a lot of gender binaries. For, for instance, like we're based in Edmonton, Alberta and the Edmonton Sport and Social 
club um, in their co-ed leagues um, has rules that only list like men and women. Instead, I've seen other organizations that have rules that are related to gender parity, but instead the rule might be you're not allowed more than seven people of one gender on your team at a time. And then instead of instead of like creating a binary of men and women, it leaves space for non-binary people to exist. Um, yeah, which I include as well. And then obviously all the really important messaging that Alex shared as well, for sure. I love that. And I think that that's also super well with our, our summit theme this year, resistance and responsibility, specifically the responsibility side. Um, you know, not just, it's not always just on uh, queer and trans folks and non-binary folks to, to bear that brunt, but also allies, right? If you say that you're going to be inclusive of folks, then like, what are you actually doing to guarantee that and, uh, and make sure people uh, have recourse to that? So thank you both. Um, we have a question. Sorry, just lost it really quickly. Um, so I have a question, I think maybe a bit more for Andy, um, but if ever folks want to also interject, I feel free to. Um, so the comment was, this wasn't specifically covered, but I'd love to hear about some thoughts on the competency of care uh, providers and safety of spaces for harm reduction spaces uh, for trans folks specifically. Um, so yeah, Andy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think there's been a kind of a little bit of a conversation going on in the chat about, um, you know, trans folks and also accessing harm reduction services. Um, I think, you know, in some spaces that I've been into, uh, there's, you know, that those symbols of inclusivity, the, those rainbow flags, those trans flags, um, frontline workers who are, are queer and trans. Um, and there was some conversation on the side here a bit about, you um, kind of the difference between accessing harm reduction supplies that maybe would be used for a uh, hormone replacement therapy um, versus um, other other uses for uh, for drug use. So um, yeah, that's a big one, knowing the difference between the, the, the materials that you're actually going to be using. So if, um, say, someone comes to you and they're trans and they express that they're looking for a certain gauge of needle, um, trust that they know what they're looking for. You know, they've been taking these substances to for and uh, you know addressing their healthcare for for quite a while. So um, if you're more used to hang, handing out what maybe would be more like a, a smaller needle or an insulin needle, if somebody's asking you uh, specifically for like a, a 22 gauge needle, that's that's what they need for their hormone injection. So yeah, just knowing the difference between kind of a, a blood-based injection needle and uh, an intra, uh, or a intramuscular or a subcutaneous needle can can definitely make a huge difference if, if they're accessing for the purposes of hormone replacement therapy for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Trusting, trusting people that they know themselves best uh, is always a good rule of thumb. Did anyone else want to quickly jump in on that? If not, maybe I just wanted to plug, uh, there was a great resource that was dropped in the chat from YouthCo, uh, a guide that touches on the harm reduction uh, for trans folks. Um, with, uh, so just check out that link in the chat uh, if you haven't already and you're interested. Um, so in the meantime, until we get another question, uh, maybe I have another question um, for Evan and Alex. Um, so what is here? So why should healthcare providers be more aware of the issues surrounding inclusion for trans athletes? So it's you know a bit of a basic question. Obviously, we know it's important, um, but more like specifically, if we had to sell pitch folks um, who are cis or who are not aware, why? How would we sell them that it's important? Other than you know we need to make sure we're accommodating to trans folks. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Um, I would say that if you look at um, social determinants of health and how like any health disparity is going to be uh, amplified by, you know, somebody being gender nonconforming, trans, anything like that. First off, you have the health issue right there that is creating a, a need for people to have more knowledge and education so that they can better serve folks who have those kind of health disparities. Um, when I think about uh, trans athletics and uh, specifically there are some aspects of you know transition that really do affect how people uh you know exercise how people work out um you know there's uh you know people i've worked with who are 
queer and trans and non-binary who assist people working out have often said that there's um, specific issues to that that can lead to injury, that can lead to worse outcomes, that can lead to um, basically pushing people out of um, those athletic spaces, not like totally ignoring all of the discrimination pieces is just like that lack of knowledge of you know, uh, somebody who starts taking testosterone, like them working out, like what does, what are, what can they expect from that? If you're not aware of that, and if you're, say, a personal trainer, that can lead to injuries and vice versa. You know, somebody who is undergoing, uh, you know, transition or hormone uh, treatment, they might have to change their workout routine. They might have to change certain things or else that could lead to an injury and being unaware of that and being somebody providing that support and service, being totally unaware of that, that might be something that would lead to an injury that, Again, physiotherapist, uh, you know, a GP, just a general, you know, your your doctor, anybody might be less informed on and could lead to poorer outcomes just from that as well. So yeah, I'd say that would be one reason for sure to be <laughs> very mindful of it. Oh, you're muted, Evan. Thanks, Alex. Sorry, <laughs> in the field of healthcare, I think sometimes we ha take a very myopic approach. Um, to, to, to looking at health outcomes. And I think we can look at trans athletics and inclusion. How could that possibly be re related to someone's health? Um, but I think um, ignoring physical activity as a determinant of health would be an incredible shortcoming of a healthcare professional, right? I think a huge messaging we try to send to Canadians is that um, healthcare is one of the, or physical activity is one of the best preventative measures for your healthcare. And I think it's really, really easy to look at rates of HIV and have that be our main focus when we're focusing on trans health. But we really need to be looking at the whole picture here because if someone doesn't feel safe accessing fit, Fitness, they're way more likely to be at risk for heart disease. Um, and so like, it's great, great for us to be aware of HIV and to focus on that. But there are so many different aspects of health that we need to look at. Also, I would say there's um, a bounty of really valuable research about trans athletics that I would say the average physician is completely ignorant of. So I think for, for me, I think that's another one of the major incredibly important issues too, is that if you have a client uh, that's trans, that's asking you for questions, um, a lot of doctors are totally ignorant about it and it's going to serve your client um, uh, to be to be more informed on on that subject, and I think like we can just look at like Dr. Mark Hatzenbuehler's research on social determinants of health to understand that it, there are a number of factors that create social determinants of health that will have really, really lasting outcomes on a number of factors. And it might seem counterintuitive to think that inclusion of support of sport could reduce rates of HIV within trans folks. Um, but I would assert that if we're looking at Hudson Bueller's research, it suggests that that might very well be the case. That's, I think, my very verbose way of saying we're being really myopic and we can't just look at one aspect of health, like sexual health. We have to look at every aspect and th that includes fitness. Amazing. That's a way, great way to sum it up. I think you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, so we are getting towards the end of the uh, session. I have a bunch of other questions prepared uh, for folks. Uh, with this conversation, I'm sure, could go on uh, with a lot of great questions to ask. Um, but we are heading towards the end. Uh, so just a reminder, if ever uh, folks want to continue the conversation, uh, we have our participant directory where you can chat with folks, and we encourage you to use that. Uh, as well, just one last plug, um, if ever anything that was said in this presentation or in other presentations today um, makes you feel anxious or distressed or in need of support, we do have counselors and mental health support workers available and ready um, to chat through the participant directory. So please feel free to look at those. You can find counselors with the letter C in their profile picture. Um, so that is the end for this uh, panel today. Thank you so much uh, to Robbie, Andy, Etienne, Alex, um, and Evan. It was uh, so refreshing to hear all of your perspectives and the presentations that you brought. Thank you so much for the effort you put into this. Um, and so we're going to head into a quick 15 minute break uh, before starting other concurrent presentations. So uh, grab a cup of water, go to the washroom, and we look forward to seeing you um, in the other presentations. So enjoy the rest of the summit.